You got to give WWE some amount of credit for what they did this week with SmackDown, even if you really don't want to. You just don't like them. You hate what they do. The reality is the way they structured the program, knowing what they were coming into for this week. You're talking about Christmas Day. You're going to have the football game. You're going to have Minnesota and New Orleans leading into you. So you're talking about millions more people watching that football game on Friday afternoon on Christmas Day than normally would are going to be on the channel. It's leading into SmackDown. And unlike another wrestling company that we know who got a real bad reality check when they stepped out of the wrestling bubble on Wednesday night because NBA Twitter let them have it when it came to how crappy Chris Jericho looked and deservedly so. The WWE started off SmackDown this week knowing that they had this big potential lead-in audience, this trickle-over audience from the Minnesota-New Orleans game and said, well, we're going to hit them and we're going to hit them big and we're going to hit them right away. And typically you would sit there and say, I'm not doing a lightly to not promoted steel cage match for the Universal Championship with my top guy of the brand, Roman Reigns, at the beginning of the show. And most weeks, I would completely and totally agree with you. Like, that's really stupid. You want to build up to that throughout the course of the night. Like, you want to have your crescendo be at the end. But in a situation like this, it is absolutely 100% sound, logical programming to structure your show in this way. And the WWE was rewarded, and WWE was rewarded in a big way. When you've got over 4 million viewers for the first hour of SmackDown, and yes, the number dropped quite dramatically in the second hour, but still a really big number, one of the biggest numbers they've had since they debuted on Fox with Friday Night SmackDown in October 2019, you got to say that it worked. And you're talking about trying to appeal to casual fans that typically don't watch. So what do you do? You trot out the dude from step one. That's impressive. You still send out your top guy. You send out the guy that people look at and say, holy crap, Like, who's this? And they say, well, that dude's impressive. And that's what the company did. When in doubt, go to the tribal chief because he's going to deliver. And man, this steel cage match for the Universal Championship, Kevin Owens, Roman Reigns, it delivered and it delivered mightily. This was a fantastic match, a fantastic piece of storytelling. Everybody played their roles incredibly well. Roman did not cheat. It's a freaking steel cage. He cannot control if his inept, incompetent cousin gets involved, almost screws it up, before kind of redeeming himself. He can't help that. But even if he could, it doesn't matter. It's not against the rules. He's not breaking the wrestling laws here. But the way they did this, like, I hesitate sometimes to do these types of matches on TV because, you know, maybe it's a little bit of the old term mindset, old school mindset of, well, you save this stuff typically for the pay-per-views, but you do have to give away something big on TV every once in a while, granted. But the way they did this, Kevin Owens comes out better for it, Roman Reigns comes out better for it, and you had planted the seed that KO could win it. And he's this close. And if you don't have this or you don't have that happen, he would win it. Like, that's the type of angle you want to do here. It creates suspense. It gets people believing in a Kevin Owens. gets people believing in a Roman Reigns match where both guys are better off for it. And a match that gives you a reason to have them wrestle again at the Royal Rumble. Like, everything about this work. So, to me, my opinion... WWE hit a home run with the opening of SmackDown this week because they went with the big dog. They went with the tribal chief. They went with the big guns. And I think that's why, in no small part, they were certainly rewarded with their overall viewership number, specifically in that first hour. Like that's a that's a massive viewership number for them to do compared to what they usually get. Um But then we get to that that triple threat elimination tag match for the women's Tag Team Championships, and again, you're throwing your biggest and best, you feel, in your brand, on your company, at this show. 
You're trying to impress people that might usually not watch SmackDown. So you want to send your A-team. You don't want to waste a bunch of time and do a bunch of crap. So I totally understand following that steel cage match with this women's tag match, triple threat elimination match. It makes total sense to me. But what doesn't make sense to me is the way that they did this. All you can say is, the Plastic Queen is back. Hashtag LOL Charlotte wins. Having Bianca lose multiple times in a row does not help make her a star. These are the type of stupid, ridiculous things that ruin pushes and ruin momentum. You did not need to have Charlotte pin Bianca Belair here. That was a conscientious decision or reckless stupidity. And I don't frankly know at this moment which one it was. And frankly, I don't know which one is worse. But either way, one of those things where you book yourself into a corner and this is the stupidity that you get. And this is why people can't get over and they don't get a chance. It's like, you know, you look at some of the women recently that have gotten over pretty well in spite of the company always believing that Charlotte is this big star that she's not. Uh, you've seen the Baileys of the world, the Sasha Banks of the world, and now you're trying to get there with Bianca Belair. And now it's like Charlotte's back and everything's going to kick rocks and everything's got to be put on the back burner for the queen with her peacock feathers. Ah, shut the hell up. She sucks. You're fucking, next time you get some plastic surgery, how about getting some ass implants? Horrible. Like, what the hell is the appeal? Anyways. But even as you started to transition into the second hour, you got Daniel Bryan versus Jey Uso. And another really good spotlight match for Jay. Another good piece of work by Daniel Bryan. You know, and this is not just some random match that's thrown together. This is a match that already has story because you've had some previous issues, some previous tension, some previous action between Daniel Bryan and Jay. Now, lo and behold, wouldn't you know, Jay failing to get the job done. It's on the short bus of cousins, I tell you. But... You know, wh where you're going with this is you're potentially teasing a Daniel Bryan maybe winning the Rumble and or getting a shot at the Tribal Chief heading into WrestleMania, maybe at WrestleMania for that Universal Championship, where the story possibilities are boundless. They're boundless. And I got to admit, initially... My reaction to the main event of this show, the Intercontinental Championship Lumberjack match. Like, how dare they? The week of Christmas, an important holiday like this, they're making our Intercontinental Champion have to defend his title again, and this time it's in a Lumberjack match, where it, there, it's not socially distanced, none of the other wrestlers are wearing masks, so now you've got your champion who should be celebrating the holidays, but instead is having to defend his title, and he's have to do so in unsafe work conditions where he knows there could be no consequences or repercussions for the company. It's not fair, I tell you, it's not fair! And my initial reaction to this is as Big E and Sammy were facing off, and knowing it had already been spoiled for me, so I knew where this was going, and seeing Big E win the Intercontinental Championship, like, no, I wasn't particularly happy about it. Because you tucked the belt off in an effective IC champion in Sami Zayn. I think that's kind of stupid. Then, from a Big E standpoint, why the hell would I celebrate him winning a mid-card title when he was somebody that I wanted to potentially be considered to win the Royal Rumble and go on to win a world title at WrestleMania? And even if you say, well, that was still potentially a possibility, so then you took the belt off of a quality Intercontinental Champion to have him have a really joke-ass, short-ass run with it. Like, that, it sucks. It absolutely sucks. So no, I'm not interested in it. Like, why should I be celebrating Big E winning a mid-card title? You know what I mean? And to those of you that say, well, he's not ready for that spot, or he's not ready. Okay. I've seen some of the a-holes you guys have called for pushes and for world title runs in recent years. Give me an effing break. 
I agree with the assertion that Big E's got a bit of a I'm having too much fun problem. Like, it's a fine line that sometimes the man, the character, goes too far with. Gets a little too suspect. Gets a little too jokey-jokey. Like, funny, I disagree with the assertion when Jim Cornette says funny doesn't draw money. Funny can draw money if it's done right at key times. That said, when you're talking about tuning in to a potential future world champion, there has to be an element of being able to take the guy seriously. And even when Big E sometimes kind of like bucks up and acts like he wants to be taken seriously, there's always that New Day crap in your back of your mind. So if you want to talk about that as a criticism, and that could potentially cause problems for him uh, becoming a world champion, similar to, I think it was a major problem with Kofi when he won the belt. Like, it was much more about the chase and the achievement than the actual title reign. He got several months, but it was hard to ever really take Kofi Kingston seriously. It was, it was different. And that act works much better in a complimentary tag team mid-card type of role than it does when you're building the entire show around it. I, I agree. But I still think it's crap. But, as I think about it more and more, if you're telling me that you're doing this because you don't think Big E's ready and you want him to get a signature win at WrestleMania defending maybe that Intercontinental Championship, okay, because there's also that part of if you're not going to have fans at WrestleMania in March, assuming it's still going to be in March, it's sounding like it's going to be in Tampa, I believe now. Um, if you don't want to do it yet because you want to save that moment for where you actually have fans, I can get down with that. Temporary annoyance for the longer term vision. I can get down with that. And especially because I think right now, you know, the more interesting story is potentially Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns. Like, you've already planted the seed there. You've put the foundation in place there. And the storytelling elements are so numerous. Multiple layers, intricacies there. Like, if you're looking for it, and, and while on the one hand, you're talking about a, a big dog, the tribal chief, Roman Reigns, you really want him to step down a level to face a Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania, you can say from a sheer storytelling aspect, that's the most interesting and compelling angle you could do. It is. Lots of potential there, lots, a lot of versatility of what you can do. Also, frankly, a shame you wouldn't have fans for that, especially if that is where the direction you're going at WrestleMania, because then you would have a clearly defined direction of Roman being the top baby face, but everybody being jerks and booing him because, oh, it's Daniel Bryan, Bryan Danielson, the American Dragon, and we can never, ever blame. And you have everybody clearly behind Daniel Bryan. Like, the dynamics would be incredible. They'd be fantastic. So, you know, oftentimes in this world, unfortunately, as soon as you say something, even in the heat of the moment, it's like you can never change or have nuance or add layers to what you said because, you know, we, we rebel against that. That's not what this world's about. But while I'm still not incredibly happy about Sami Zayn dropping the Intercontinental Championship, I understand why he might have done it on this show. The timing could potentially make sense. I could understand putting it, that, that strap on Big E at this time, even though I'm not 100% in favor of it. I don't have to be 100% in favor of it. You know, I can understand it. But still in general, you know, a couple of the matches here were really, really good pay-per-view worthy type of stuff. So I applaud this company for how they programmed and positioned themselves with this show. It all started off with the right choice at the beginning. Isn't that funny how it works? If you make the right choice at the beginning, everything else kind of falls in line. And for this week's show, just like it should be for every show, when you start with the Tribal Chief, good things happen. And if you agree with me, smash that subscribe button, click the bell, what the hell, so that way you're notified of future videos. If you don't agree with me and you haven't done so already, you should still hashtag subscribe or die. So that way every time I put up a new video, you can vent a little bit about the world and blame me for your problems and get that crap and that negativity out of your system. Send it my direction. I'm a big boy. I can take it. I'm not a punk ass like some of these others on YouTube. Either way, I enjoyed SmackDown a lot this week. It was a nice way to finish off Christmas Day.